Today, I want to share with you from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Chapter 11, verse 7. It's just one verse, so we're going to read it all together in one voice. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Let's begin. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. All together, let's read it once more. Let's begin. By faith, Noah, when he warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. For those of you who are not familiar with the story about Noah and the ark, uh, let me kind of briefly summarize and uh, enlighten you about his life. Noah was a righteous man, was a godly man, but he was one of the few. In fact, Bible tells us he was the only one, he and his family. Though the rest of the world, the people living at that time, they were wicked. They rejected God, they turned away from God, and they did things as they pleased, uh, not according to God's way. And God decided to judge them. So God decided to say, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to wipe the entire mankind from this world. And I'm going to do it with a flood. So he told Noah, he said, Noah, I want you to build an ark, a big boat. And I want you to build that ark. And I want you to build it according to my instructions. And, when, and then wait for the flood. Well, I'm going to stop the story right then and there. Because that's the area that I want to focus on right now. But before I continue with that story, I want to just share with you an interesting fact. In Illinois, it's a, one of the states in uh, America, in, uh, in Il Illinois, uh, the telephone company, they reported that at this one time, a volume of long-distance calls made on Father's Day was growing faster than the number on Mother's Day, which is, which is very unique because I shared with you a few weeks ago that you know, Mother's Day is the one that most people practice and most children uh, uh, practice and, 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 and take, that, uh, take advantage of that day to, you know, encourage their moms. And fathers are usually ignored. But on this occasion, the number of phone calls were increasing at a faster rate than Mother's Day. Uh, the company apologized for the, de de uh, why am I stuttering? The company apologized for the delay in, in coming out and sharing the statistics. And the reason why they said they had this delay was that all the phone calls that were being made on Father's Day were collect calls. Collect calls. That means, do you understand collect calls? They, they make a phone call, but the person on the receiving end are the ones that are paying for the calls. That means usually the children are calling and asking for money. And, and uh, okay, that was funny to me. Okay, over the years, the fathers have gotten the short end of the stick. That means that the mothers really receive the bulk of acknowledgement, bulk of the love and acknowledgement from our children. Um, in America, during sporting events, I watch a lot of sports, and uh, sometimes the cameraman would just zoom in and go up to the athletes when they're resting and when they're sitting down, and the first words that comes out of those athletes' mouths when they see the camera are these. Hi, mom. You know, hi, mom. You know, I love you, mom. Hi, mom. Rarely, if ever, have I ever heard an athlete look in the camera and go, hi, dad. I love you, dad. It's always the mom that gets, the, that gets all the love. And there are many reasons for that. Number one are, is because mothers are usually more nurturing. You know, fathers, are little, we're more kind of, you know, you know how should I say, uh, we're more stiff in our you know, outer expression. We're, we're not as verbal in our expressing our love and we're not as sensitive or you know emotional as mothers uh, and another reason is because mothers usually spend more time with the kids than fathers let's be fair you know on, on the average you know mothers spend more time with the children than the fathers and lastly because mothers are usually more sensitive than the fathers you know when the kids you know when the kids run and fall down you know the mother you know fathers when they see that the fathers usually go stand up don't cry stand up you know, it's the mothers that go, oh, poor baby, poor baby, and so forth. So, you know, we, see, we understand why mothers get usually all the love and, and more than the fathers. But I believe there's another reason why mothers get the love and the fathers don't. And that's because I believe, in all honesty, 
the fathers have not done their job as they, sh as they should. The fathers haven't done the job that they should. And I share this message really not just for the fathers here, but also for all of you who are fathers-to-be. And for all the mothers and, and uh, mothers-to-be, I want you to understand what fathers' roles are. Over the years, we've used many excuses. And the biggest excuse that we've used is the excuse of work to justify not, f not fulfilling our role as a father. You know, the, the excuse that we use, the work that we use as an excuse, it may be justifiable, but in the end, it is still an excuse. And I want to share with you a very touching story that I, that I read. It's a story, it's a true story about a young, successful attorney. You know, when asked about, you know, what made you successful, and he said this is one of the reasons that really made him who he was today. Quote, he says, The greatest gift I ever received was one I got, uh, one, one that I got on Christmas, when my dad gave me a small box. Inside was a note that read, Son, this year I will give you 365 hours, an hour every day after dinner. It's yours. We'll talk about what you want to talk about. We'll, we'll go where you want to go. Play what you want to play. It will be your hour. My dad not only kept his promise, he said, but every year he renewed it. And it was the greatest gift I've ever had in my entire life. I am the result of his time. In today's society, too many of our children grow up without a father. And I'm not talking about children of in a family where they're divorced. I'm not talking about a children where father died. I'm talking about children who grow up with a mother and father. And yet, they're growing up without a father. Not necessarily a physical presence, but they're growing up without a father, without the emotional presence and the emotional support that we are supposed to give to our children. Our children are growing up without fathers that care. Today, I want to take a look at the life of Noah. Noah was really one of the greatest examples that we have in the Bible about a father that genuinely cared about his children. There are three things that I want to share with you, three characteristics that we can learn from, glean from in the life of Noah. Number one is that Noah was a man, if you notice, he listened to God. Now, the reason why God spoke to Noah was because, according to the Bible, he was a righteous man. In Genesis 6, 9, it tells us that God spoke to Noah because Noah was a righteous man and that he walked with God. Noah listened to God. Noah was righteous. He obeyed God. One of the greatest responsibilities that we have as a father is to be an example to, be our, to our children. That is one of the greatest responsibilities that we have. Noah was such a man. Bible tells us he was righteous. That means he was honest. He was hardworking. He was someone that his children could be proud of. And the later on in the, in, the, in, the, in the sermon, I'll share with you that children did, his children did feel that way about his father. See, we as a father has a responsibility not just to make money, not just to provide, not just to protect. As a father, we have a responsibility to be an example to, to, uh, to our children. That means that we have a responsibility to work. We have a responsibility to serve, to help, to be honest, to work hard, and to spend time with our family. You know, most parents hate to admit this, but our kids are usually direct reflection of the parents. Every parenting book that I've read, and I've read many of them, they tell us that parents exert the greatest influence on the lives of our children. I look at children that are respectful. I, res I, respect I look at children that are respectful, that have good manners. And you know what? When I look at the parents, I can, I can see why. Because parents are just like that as well. When I look at children uh, that respect their moms, you know what I notice? Without exception is usually because the moms, I mean the dads, 
respect the mom as well. When dads look down on mom, their mom, when the dads yell at the moms, guess what? Children do the same thing. You see, as a father, as a parent, we have this great responsibility. One of them is to be an example, to be a righteous man before them. Second thing that we can learn about Noah was that Noah was a man of action. See, God gave Noah a warning. They said, God said, you know, I'm going to send a flood. And this land will be wiped out. And everyone's life is in danger. When Noah heard that, he immediately went into action. When he heard that his family, his children, were in danger, he went into action. Noah built the ark, not necessarily to save his life, but to save the lives of his children. James Dobson is one of the most respected Christian counselor in America. And according to, according to him, in his book, he says, a man in his ultimate priority, he says, dad's number one responsibility is to evangelize his own children. There is no higher calling on the face of the earth. As a father, one of our main responsibility and duty as a father is to save the lives of our family, especially the lives of our children. And I'm not talking about saving their lives from thieves or car accidents. I'm talking about saving the lives of our children from eternal death. But again, as fathers, we sit by and we use the work as an excuse to pass on that responsibility of saving the lives of our children to our wives, to the mothers. It is our responsibility. It is the father's responsibility. That is what being the head of the family means in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 5, 23, where he says, husband is the head. It does not mean that the father is the master or the ruler. It simply means that as a father, we are responsible for our family. We are responsible for our children. And lastly, the third thing that we can learn from the life of Noah was that Noah was a builder. As a father, Noah was a builder. Noah wasn't just a builder of, a, of boats, but he was a builder of relationships. He not only built right relationships with his father, but he built right relationships with his family and children. Do you know how I know that? When God told Noah to build the ark, he did. He completed building the ark. But do you think Noah built that ark by himself? When you have time, when you read the story, Noah didn't build the ark by himself. He built it with his sons, with his children, with his family. When God told Noah, let's build the ark, and when Noah told his family, we need to build the ark, you didn't see his grown-up children looking at his father and says, Dad, are you crazy? You've been out in the sun too long. Dad, I'm busy. I'm going to do my own thing. No. When Noah went to his children and said, God told me to build the ark. We need to build it together. The children obeyed. You see, a relationship like that doesn't come. It just doesn't come all of a sudden. It is built. You know, one of the things that I regret, I'm not sure whether it's my regret, but the thing that I have regrets about is that, that I didn't have a relationship like that with my father. I think I shared this story maybe a long time ago, about a year ago. But when my father passed away, before he passed away, when he got older and when he became a Christian, you know, we would try to spend time together, but it was very awkward. We just didn't have that relationship because for 60 years we did not spend, we did not build that relationship together, and to all of a sudden try to be a friend to one another, it was very very difficult. See, God has called us fathers to build relationships, not only to our wives, with our wives, but with our children. One of the biggest mistakes, in my opinion, and let me just tell you this: I love my father. I love my father. And I would do anything for my father. But he was not a perfect man. And one of the mistakes that my father made that I promised that I would never make in my life was this. Whenever my father wanted to do something, whenever my father wanted to go, whether it's, you know, fix a car, whether he wanted to build something, I have always wanted to, as a child, 
help him and do things with him. I remember. But I also remember his words whenever I wanted to do things with him. In Korean, he would say to me, you know, he said, Paul, don't bother daddy. You will, you are, you will help me by not helping me. You can help me by staying out of my way. And guess what? I stayed out, I stayed out of his way. In the, in the Bible, when Noah built the ark, he didn't just do it himself. He did it with his children because he wanted to build, continue to build that relationship with his children. And one of the things that I want to do, and I have, I have never, I, I need to be careful when I use the word never, but I have never told my son and daughter, don't help me, stay out of my way. I tell them, you can do it for a little bit. I always tell them, okay, maybe you can do it later. Maybe you can do something else. In fact, during this week, yesterday, in fact, I was very convicted. I wanted to, there was a hand-washing car wash place nearby. And normally, when I, you know, when I wash cars, it's much easier for me to do it alone. You know, just go there, do it by myself. It's really quick. Because I know that if my children go there, they'll want to do it and so forth. But I decided to take my children with me. And lo and behold, my son goes, Dad, I want to try it. My daughter said, I want to try it. And I said, okay, you try it. I had to spend an extra dollar to make the, you know, for the extra time because of my children. But it was money well invested because I was building a relationship with my children. You know, one of the things, I've worked with youth. I've worked with teenagers for nearly 14 years in America. And this is a fact. I have never, ever heard, when I asked the question, what do you want from your dad? Never once did a young teenager say, say to me, I want, more, I want more money from my father. Never once did I hear from a child, I want my dad to give me a bigger house. Never once did I hear from a child saying, I want my dad to work harder and become successful. Almost every single time, the child's response was, I just, want, I just want to spend more time with dad. I just want to spend more time with my dad. Rick Hoyt, the child that you saw in the video, and these are his words. He said, Dad is one of my role models. Once he sets out to do something, Dad sticks to it, whatever it is, until it is done. For example, we decided to really get into triathlons. Dad worked out up to five hours a day, five times a week, even when he was working. Never dad, never once did the children say, I'm so proud of my dad because my dad makes lots of money. I'm talking about young children. Never once did I see young teenagers say, I'm so proud of my dad because he's a president. The words that I've often hear, I say, I'm so proud of my dad because you know what? He plays with me. I'm so proud of my dad because he taught me how to play baseball. He taught me how to play basketball. I love my dad because once a year, my dad takes me camping. And never once did I hear from a child, I'm so proud of my dad because he makes lots of money. Today, Well, I want to share, what I want to say is this. As fathers, we often give to our children what we want to give to our children. I think that is the, one of the greatest mistakes that we make as a father. We give to our children what we think they want. We give to our children bicycles because we think that's what they want. We give to our children clothes because we think that's what they want. We give to our children uh, you know, fancy schools and after school programs because we think that's what they want. And maybe that is what they want. But the thing that our children want the most is a time with their dad. And I want to just challenge all of you today. As fathers, let's give to our children what they want, not what we want to give. Normally I don't do this, but today I'm going, I'm going to show you the video the second time. Just so you know, I watched this video five times as I was preparing the sermon. Just to remind me, remind myself over and over again 
a, a model of what a father is. So I want to just remind you once again, challenge all of you, not only fathers, but also to all of you young men. Think about once again what it means to be a father. Noah was an example to his children. Noah was a man of action when it came to saving the lives of his children. And Noah was a builder. He was a builder of relationship with his children. Let's remember this as we watch this video once more. Let us pray.